This time on The Greats, Hollywood legend Betty Davis. Boxing's brown bomber, Joe Louis. Entertainment powerhouse, Madonna. And floor genius, Orson Welles. But first, Benjamin Franklin. American founding father, scientist, inventor, activist, statesman, diplomat and author. They don't come much greater than Benjamin Franklin. Born in Boston in 1706, Franklin was schooled until the age of 10, when he went to work first for his father, then as an apprentice in his brother James's printing business. At 17, Franklin ran away to Philadelphia after it was discovered that he was the writer behind a series of controversial letters published in his brother's newspaper, the New England Courant. He continued to work as a printer, and by 1730, he was publishing his own newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. Seven years later, Franklin was appointed postmaster of Philadelphia, at a time when the post was haphazard and poorly organized. A prolific correspondent, Franklin placed great value on communication. He set up more direct routes, built milestones, and directed mail wagons to travel at night as well as day. Mail times were slashed in half, and delivery became more reliable. An inveterate traveler, Franklin was fascinated by weather phenomena, and was the first to observe that storms could move in a different direction from the wind. He spent many voyages setting up experiments to measure ocean temperature, and was the first to chart the Gulf Stream that flows through the Atlantic Ocean. His inventions were amazingly practical, ranging from the bifocal lens, swim fins, and the odometer, to lightning rods, daylight savings time, and the three-wheel clock. His most famous experiment was to fly a kite during a lightning storm to prove that lightning was electrical, although no one knows exactly how the experiment was carried out. Franklin had a great love of music and designed the glass harmonica, constructed from 37 different glass globes providing a range of pitches. Mozart was just one of the composers who created music especially for the instrument. Franklin's public life included a stint in the Pennsylvania Assembly and a diplomatic posting to London a few years before the colonies went to war against Britain during the American Revolution. Interestingly, Franklin designed the continental currency issued by Congress. His image is now enshrined on the US $100 bill. Franklin had an illegitimate son, William, who was raised by Franklin and his common-law wife, Deborah Reed, and went on to become the last colonial governor of New Jersey. Franklin had first met Deborah as a 17-year-old, but was unable to obtain her mother's consent to the match before he left for England, where he was carrying out a mission for the governor of Pennsylvania. Instead, Deborah was married to a man who soon deserted her, leaving her unable to legally end the union. Nevertheless, the couple established an informal marriage and remained together until Deborah's death in 1774. By that time, Franklin was one of the most famous men in the world. Future President John Adams wrote of him, his reputation is greater than that of Newton, Frederick the Great or Voltaire, his character more revered than all of them. There's scarcely a coachman or a footman or scullery maid who does not consider him a friend of all mankind. Posted to Paris during the American War of Independence, he was met with acclaim. His inventions, great works, and freshness of thought were seen to be particularly American. In 1776, Franklin cemented his place in American history by becoming one of the five men to draft the American Declaration of Independence. One of the new country's most popular and influential citizens, he was unanimously elected the President of Pennsylvania, serving until his death aged 84 in 1790. In 1728, as a youthful writer, Franklin had written what he hoped would become his own epitaph. The body of B. Franklin printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here, food for worms. But the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will, as he believed, 
appear once more in a new and more perfect edition, corrected and amended by the author. The epitaph on her tombstone reads, She did it the hard way. A line suggested to her by Joseph L. Mankiewicz shortly after they made All About Eve together. And those six words simply and elegantly sum up why Betty Davis was one of the greatest of all the Hollywood screen stars. Born Ruth Elizabeth Davis in 1909, she was always known as Betty, but changed the spelling in her teens out of admiration for Balzac's novel La Cousine Bette. Her 60-year acting career included two Academy Awards for Best Actress, numerous iconic roles, four husbands, and one notoriously ungrateful daughter. But success never came easily to Betty. Although she had one of the most striking and expressive faces in cinema, she was never considered conventionally beautiful. And her first forays into Hollywood were not encouraging. A production assistant left her at the train station because he didn't see anyone who looked like an actress. She was with Universal for about three years and 20 mediocre films, while also being lent to small studios like Capitol Films for 1932's Hell's House. Finally, though, she signed with Warner Brothers, appeared in her breakthrough role as Mildred Rogers in 1934's Of Human Bondage, and her career began to take off. The role was significant for Betty in more ways than one. It marked her willingness to play unsympathetic characters, a tray unusual among her contemporaries, and one that stood her in great stead throughout her career. Her reputation soared when her widely acclaimed performance in the film was overlooked at Oscar time, resulting in a campaign to change the way nominations were organized. The following year, she won her first Academy Award for Dangerous, and then was cast in a succession of second-rate pictures, causing her to eventually break her contract by appearing in a couple of English films. Warner Brothers sued their opinionated star, with their barrister, Sir Patrick Hastings, painting a picture of a greedy actress who only cared about a pay packet. Betty, however, claimed that the film she was being given would kill her career stone dead. She lost the case, but paved the way for stars like Olivia de Havilland to win similar cases in subsequent years. And despite her off-screen battles and the loss of face, her career did improve again. Marked Woman in 1937 earned her excellent reviews, and 1938's Jezebel was one of her greatest hits, winning her a second Academy Award. Off-screen, she had a passionate affair with director William Wyler, and though he refused to leave his wife for her, she would nevertheless later refer to him as the love of her life. In the late 30s and early 40s, she was nominated for an Oscar five times in a row, and with 1962's Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, became the first woman to gain 10 nominations. Her career fell into the doldrums again in the late 40s, but the woman who once described herself as uncompromising, peppery, intractable, monomaniacal, tactless, volatile, and oft-times disagreeable, simply picked herself up and went back to work, because, as she said, someone had to pay for the groceries. One of the most fortunate moments in Betty's career was when she received the call that Claudette Colbert had pulled out of All About Eve. Betty recognized the screenplay as one of the best she'd ever read and jumped at the chance to play Margot Channing. The part earned her another Academy Award nomination and a fourth husband, co-star Gary Merrill. Her career continued to peak and nosedive in turn, right up until her death from breast cancer in 1989. She was devastated in her later years to have been the subject of a particularly mean-spirited biography by her daughter. And in 1981, the first woman to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Film Institute experienced a whole new level of fame with younger audiences as the subject of Kim Khan's monster hit, Betty Davis Eyes. One of 
the greatest heavyweight champions the world has ever seen, African-American prize fighter Joe Louis was once described by sports writer Jimmy Cannon as a credit to his race, the human race. Born the son of an Alabama cotton picker in 1914, Louis ignored his trainer's advice to fight only black boxers and won Michigan's Golden Gloves title before turning pro in 1934. The following year, he came to public attention by winning his first 27 fights, defeating champions such as Primo Canera and Spaniard Paulino Uscudin, who had never been knocked down before Louis KO'd him. The money from his fights piled up, but Louis was known for his generosity and was constantly giving it away to people in need. He even repaid the city of Detroit the $250 his family once received in welfare checks. Dubbed the Brown Bomber of Detroit, Louis's dedication to his sport was so great that on the day of his wedding to singer Marva Trotter, he fought and won a bout against popular heavyweight champion Max Baer. A thrilling victory, and now with a bride to enjoy it with him, it's needless to say that Joe is quite happy, aren't you, Joe? Yeah, very happy. <laughs> uh, well, uh, tell us, fella, what makes you happier, to have beaten Bear or to be married? I think to be married. <laughs> well, you'll readily admit that it was a pretty tough fight while it lasted, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a tough fight, but I think I have a tough fight home every night. <laughs> <laughs> Now that you're on the threshold of a championship bout and married, what are your plans? That's yes, me. I'm going to stay boss. That's nice work, Joe, if you can get it. But in 1936, he met his match in German Max Schmeling. Schmeling and his trainers analyzed film footage of Louis's fights and discovered that Louis let his guard down slightly in the moment between delivering his famous jab and following up with the left hook. By stepping slightly back, Schmeling could evade the short jab and exploit the weakness with a straight right. The strategy was masterly, and 12 rounds later, in the upset of the year, Louis was counted out for the first time in his career. Black Americans were devastated, and there was rioting in Harlem. Although he defeated some big-name opponents soon after, Louis said he would not consider himself a heavyweight champion until he had defeated Schmeling in a rematch. That opportunity came on June the 22nd, 1938, at Yankee Stadium. After running an intense publicity campaign about Germany's Aryan supremacy, the Nazis were humiliated when Schmeling went down for the count only two minutes and four seconds into the first round. Well, Joe, you sure mowed him down tonight, didn't you, boy? I did. What blow do you think put him away? A right hand. And what now, Joe? Well, I guess whoever they pick for me. How about Tony Galento? I'll fight him. Lou Nova? He's a good fighter. How about Maxie Bear? Well, I'll fight Bear too. Well, Joe, you're willing to fight any of them, aren't you? I'm here. When hostilities began in 1941, Louis became a poster boy for army recruitment as the highest profile African-American soldier, despite the fact that the army was still racially segregated. Thanks to his influence, black soldiers were admitted to officer training school for the first time. Louis's war service was mostly symbolic, and he traveled to Europe to boost morale, playing exhibition boxing matches to entertain the troops, donating the money he earned to the war effort. After the war, Louis continued to fight. His famous saying, he can run but he can't hide, was spoken in response to his 1946 rematch against Billy Conn, who said he planned to strike at Louis and then run away. Three years later, Louis retired from the ring, but he remained a popular celebrity. He died in 1981 and was buried with full military honors in Arlington Cemetery, remembered by boxing fans around the world as one of the greatest legends of the game. In March 2008, five months before her 50th birthday, one of the most successful women in the history of popular music was inducted into the American Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Madonna Louise Veronica Ciccone Ricci, or Madonna, 
as she is known across the entire planet, has an incredible list of accomplishments to her name. During a career that began with the dance hit Everybody in 1982, she has sold over 200 million albums worldwide. The Guinness Book of Record lists her as the most successful female musician, and in 2005, she equaled Elvis's record of 36 top 10 hits on America's Billboard charts. Her 2006 Confessions concert tour was the highest grossing ever by a female artist, and she's proved herself to be the queen of reinvention. You know, like uh, a cat has nine lives, mm -hmm. you know? So, so you can take punches, you, you always Keep come back Keep coming up. back. Yeah, you yeah. come back. Madonna's indefatigable personality and fierce ambition are her trademarks. I, I take my inspiration from, from everywhere. Uh, in this record in particular, I was inspired by the music of Giorgio Moroder, um, Abba, Chic, Pet Shop Boys, <laughs> um, Chironi, um, I think, I mean, lots of other people, but those were the main inspirations, and I guess most of those artists are European, so maybe that, maybe that's why you think that. But it's not just other artists who inspire and influence Madonna. Her work is suffused with references to sexuality, religion, and politics, and her outspokenness and unapologetic bravura in exploring these issues mean that throughout her career, her records and videos have polarized both the public and critics, to say nothing of the Pope, who more than once has dissuaded Catholics from attending her concerts. Madonna has branched out from her musical pursuits in recent years, moving on from the notoriously graphically erotic images of her 1992 book, Sex. She's been writing children's books, and in 2003, her debut offering, The English Roses, became the best-selling children's picture book of all time. She is now the mother of three children, Lourdes, born in 1996 to personal trainer Carlos Leon, Rocco, born in 2000 to English film director Guy Ritchie, whom Madonna married later that year, and Malawi-born David, whom the couple adopted as a one-year-old in 2006, to a by now familiar controversial response from the media. Never shy of sharing herself with her public, Madonna's sex book and the autobiographic nature of some of her lyrics haven't been the only revelatory aspects of her career. In 1991, there was Truth or Dare, a film by Alex Kershishian, documenting her blonde ambition tour. And in 2005, she released a second documentary called I'm Going to Tell You a Secret. Directed by Jonas Ackerland, it debuted on MTV and followed the course of her 2004 reinvention world tour. And in the spirit of assuming the mantle of elder stateswoman of pop in her mid-forties, Madonna was surprisingly embracing of those who followed in her footsteps. She was seen sporting a Britney Spears t-shirt in 2006, and the pair raised many an eyebrow and generated a million column inches when they shared a passionate on-stage kiss at the MTV Video Awards. Madonna also provided the guest vocals on Britney's hit single, Me Against the Music. It could be argued that to cover Madonna's extraordinary life and career thoroughly would take a whole series. But what is incontrovertible is that not only is she fully deserving of her place in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, her unparalleled career in entertainment means she is truly one of the all-time greats. Precocious, opinionated, and the bane of Hollywood moguls, Orson Welles once said he thought an artist should always be out of step with his time. That was certainly the case for him, with Citizen Kane taking years to be seen as a masterpiece. Welles burst onto the stage as the enfant terrible responsible for panicking a nation with his legendary 1938 radio dramatization of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, I'm, of course, surprised that the H.G. Wells classic, which is the original for many fantasies about invasions by mythical monsters from the planet Mars, I'm extremely surprised to learn that 
a story which has become familiar to children through the medium of comic strips and uh, many succeeding novels and adventure stories should have had such an immediate and profound effect upon radio listeners. The publicity launched Wells' Hollywood career. RKO signed him to a contract that gave him complete creative control, unprecedented for a first-time director. His first film to come to screen was Citizen Kane, now considered to be one of the greatest movies of all time. Wells wrote, directed and starred in the film. A lot of the blue crayon crossing out of dialogue we believe to be Wells himself because he was known for doing that. And you will see entire passages that are rewritten, again, to sharpen the language, to sharpen the characters. It's great because there's a huge metamorphosis between the first script and the final shooting script. Orson Welles supposedly either gave or lost in a poker game to or somehow the Oscar went to one of his cinematographers and stayed with him for a number of years. Uh, Orson Welles' youngest daughter, Beatrice Welles, in the late 80s petitioned the Academy to get a replacement Oscar, which they gave her. And at the time, she signed an addendum that evidently stipulated that they would have first right of refusal both for the replacement Oscar and for the original. Interestingly enough, in a Sotheby's auction in the 90s, the original came up for sale. Beatrice Wells sued and won and got the original Oscar back and in 2003 consigned it to Christie's. But Wells' Oscar for Best Original Screenplay was one of the few accolades the film received at the time of its release. Protagonist Charles Foster Kane was a thinly disguised version of newspaper publisher William Randolph Hearst. So the Hearst media empire blackballed the film, severely affecting its profits. Years later, when Citizen Kane was reassessed as a masterpiece, Wells quipped that he started at the top and worked his way down during his film career. Certainly, he never reached the creative height of his first film, but several of his later efforts were far from contemptible. He was furious when his second film, The Magnificent Ambersons, was taken out of his hands at the editing stage later failing dismally at the box office. The Stranger came next, with Wells playing a Nazi war criminal hiding in middle-class America. The film Noir was his first production to make a profit, but Wells decided Hollywood's success was not for him. This belief was reinforced by the 1948 Columbia Pictures production, The Lady from Shanghai, starring Wells' estranged wife, Rita Hayworth. Studio head Harry Cohn hated the film, and ordered extensive changes. Although it did well in Europe, the film flopped in America, and Wells decided his future was on the continent. Despite his undoubted talent as a director, writer, and actor, Wells struggled to raise money to make films. He returned to Hollywood for Touch of Evil in 1958, but again had creative control ripped from his grasp before final cut. Wells died in 1985, aged 70, rejected by Hollywood, but revered by film lovers.